I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and welcome to Becoming a Nature Observer with the Carmel Clay Public Library. I'm Julie from the Adult Services Department and we're excited to have you with us tonight for this program. Amanda Wanless is here tonight from Indiana Phenology and she's going to help us tune into our surroundings and increase our nature awareness. I have you all muted so we can hear Amanda without any distractions. So if you have questions during the course of the program, go ahead and pop those into the chat and we will get to those at the end of the program. We'll make sure we have time to do that. So now I'm gonna hand things over to Amanda, but I'll come back at the end to let you know about some upcoming programs at the library. All right, thank you very much. I am excited to talk to you tonight. Um, I am the executive director of Indiana Phenology, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what we do a little bit later on in the program. Um, but tonight I'm gonna talk to you about observing nature and about a specific tool um, for nature observation called Nature's Notebook. But before we jump into that, let's take a few minutes to set the stage, so to speak. Let me make sure I'm on the right screen there. There, now I can advance those slides. Um, so nature observation is really all about going outside and being in nature and noticing nature with your eyes wide open, um, slowing down to see and hear and experience what's going on around us all the time, but that we're so often too busy to even notice. Um, and unless you're really lucky right now, it doesn't look like any one of us are outside right now, but we're inside. Um, looking at our computers, not in a very natural location. Uh, so it's it's hard to observe nature without being in nature. So really that's step one, oh so obvious, um, go find some nature and get outside um, or even looking out your window. It's There are things that you can see all year round. So if we were to go outside right now, um, what would we see? We might see something like this. Uh, this is a picture I took a few days ago. Um, and it is one of the beautiful native spring ephemerals. Actually, there are at least two in that picture that you can see there. Um, but what else can we see right now? We'd see leaves bursting. We'd see those uh, spring bulbs uh, coming up and flowering, those spring wildflowers. Maybe you've got dandelions like I do right now. Our grass is beginning to grow again. Um, those are some things that we can see right now. So I want you to take a moment though and think about your favorite season. What makes that your favorite season? Just think for a moment. It's a safe bet that it's something unique about that season. Um, and so what, what makes those seasons different? We could talk about the earth and the sun, and we could talk about those sorts of things um, as to what makes seasons different in the weather, but something else that makes those seasons unique is phenology. Um, this might not be a term you've ever heard, but while you don't know the word, it's what you see happening around you all the time. It is something that I know each one of you are intimately familiar with. Um, it's really all of those things that make each season unique. So let's give phenology an actual definition here. Uh, phenology is focused on the recurring life cycle events in plants and animals, all living things. Um, in plants, we're talking about things like their leafing and their flowering, um, the ripening of crops in the fields, that's phenology, the emergence of insects, phenology there again, migration of birds, nesting of birds, all of that is phenology. It's the science of the seasons and the study of those seasonal, seasonal cyclical changes, um, which we call phenophases, and how their timing and relationships um, with each other are linked to the weather and conditions around that living creature. So phenology happens everywhere, literally happening right now everywhere. All of those pictures there, those are phenology. Um, and it's happening all the time, nest building, leaf out, flowers blooming, migration, all of that is phenology. So what makes those seasons different? It's those cyclical things. It's what the plants and animals are doing. Um, it's the weather. Phenology is all about what's happening when in nature and why. And it's, we call, this is a program, it's an introduction to nature observation, but we could have also called it an introduction to phenology because when you're observing nature, 
that's really what you're observing. Um, you're observing the phenology, what those plants and animals are doing and how this relates to what is going on in, in the world around you. Um, so for plants and animals, uh, life cycle stages that we can observe, uh, animals were looking at their activity, um, their reproduction, their development, what they're eating. For plants, we're looking at things like the leaves and the flowers and the fruits. Um, and each of these, different observable life cycle stages are called phenophases. So nature observation is really about what you can learn and see when you start to look at the world in a new way. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna to go from that big picture landscape level or the world that's flashing past your window when you ride down the street. And we're gonna get a little closer and up personal with it and um, start noticing the flowers on a branch and then even zoom in more all the way on the individual flowers themselves. And that's what nature observation is about. Uh, so another note about observing nature, it can become even more rewarding when you begin documenting what you see. I love this quote here. Um, when you begin writing down what you're seeing and when you're seeing it and what else is happening at the same time, you can begin to be able to compare this year to last year in a concrete way or compare what's happening now to what's happening in other places and really learn um, on a whole new level how nature is really working. So today I'd like to talk to you about Indiana Backyard Observing and using a program called Nature's Notebook for record keeping of this type. And this is really my favorite way of uh, documenting nature and the timing of things that's going on around me. I've tried lots of other ways of keeping records, including like handwritten journals and things like that, but I love nature's notebook and I wanna tell you all about it. But let's spend just another minute or two going on um, a little bit more background on phenology to put into context how we use nature's notebook. So we talked about the definition of phenology. Um, and as you'll recall, it's that study of the cyclical recurring life cycle events in plants and animals and their connection to the weather and the aspects of the environment in which they live. Um, it's a key feature of life on earth. So birds time their nesting so the eggs hatch when the insects are available to feed their nestlings. In turn, that insect emergence is synchronized with the leaf out in the host plants. Um, people even, uh, we even utilize phenology or interact with phenology. Um, you can think of allergy season. That starts when particular flowers bloom. And if the timing of that flowering is earlier, that means we've got allergies starting earlier. Um, farmers and gardeners instinctively uh, pay attention to the phenology so that they know when to plant um, the schedule of the development, when to harvest, um, and make, make decisions like that. But phenology really affects all aspects of the environment. What the plants and animals are doing and when that life cycle stage they're, they are in um, impacts the abundance and diversity of organisms, their interactions with each other, their functions in the food web, who is going to eat what and when, um, their seasonal behavior, and even on a global scale, uh, phenology really impacts the cycles of water and carbon and other chemical elements. Um, phenology plays a role in our health. We've talked about allergies, but there's also pest-borne diseases. Um, when you can get certain diseases from the mosquito really depends on the mosquito phenology. When is it out? When is it not? Um, where is it in its development stage? All of that, the mosquito phenology impacts our um, physical health and those pest-borne diseases. Um, and the timing of different plant and animal activities impacts our recreation opportunities or conservation activities or even the potential hazards and risks that we may be um, facing. Uh, so from the beginning of time, humans have been paying attention to phenology. Earlier in human history, people were more in tune with nature as a society than we are today mostly because they had to be, because paying careful attention to their surroundings meant the difference between survival and death. And while we're a little more um, distanced from that need to pay attention to phenology, um, it's really just as crucial for our survival now as it, it has been at any point in the past. And 
Interestingly, phenology really is also an indicator of environmental change of all types. Um, it's, all, it's particularly important for climate change science because um, changes in phenological events like flowering and bird migrations are among the most sensitive biological responses to changing climate um, because the weather and that immediate environmental conditions are really such a big part of what cues an organism to move into its next life cycle stage. And across the world, um, we're seeing many spring events occurring earlier and fall events happening later than they did in the past. Um, so when we study how plants and animals respond to their climate, um, that helps us to predict whether their populations will grow or shrink um, depending on how the environment is changing, which really makes it a leading indicator of climate change impacts. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, what spring events are occurring earlier? Well, scientists are seeing on average that springs are occurring two days earlier per decade than they did in the past. And they're seeing this trend toward earlier springs in 62% of the species studied. We're talking about things like trees getting their leaves earlier, earlier flowering, earlier migration, earlier breeding of birds and amphibians, earlier emergence from hibernation. Um, scientists have studied all these things and they're finding that they're happening earlier than they did in the past. Um, so in short, many different species are responding to changing conditions by starting their spring activities earlier than they did 100 years ago or even 10 years ago. But, and this is important, not all species and not all regions are changing at the same rate, um, which leads to something that we can call a mismatch. So the way that story would go is, um, we'll explore that with looking at this oak tree and a migratory bird and a caterpillar. Each species really has a specific role to play in its environment. And um, when one species starts its spring activities earlier than the other species, um, this impacts the whole uh, cycle and the whole environment. Um, so let's imagine we've got this migratory bird here and its nestlings food source is this caterpillar that feeds on the young leaves of this oak tree. So in the past, the migratory birds were cued by the conditions in their wintering grounds to return to their breeding grounds. They laid their eggs, which then hatched just as the numbers of caterpillars peaked, which provided lots of food for those nestlings and um, the birds thrived. But now, uh, responding to earlier spring weather, the caterpillars are emerging earlier so that the peak in caterpillar abundance happens earlier. Um, but if the conditions in the, the wintering grounds are different than they are in the uh, breeding grounds, the birds aren't really able to keep up and lay their eggs early enough for those egg hatch to coincide with the peak caterpillar abundance, which results in a phenological mismatch. So in areas where the birds are mismatched like this with their food source, um, scientists have seen declines of up to 90% in the populations. And the earlier um, those caterpillars turn into moths, the greater the decline in the population of the bird, the bird population size. And um, this image here with those nine songbirds, those are nine that scientists have found to be unable to keep up with the shifting spring. So their nesting isn't tied anymore to the peak in the nestling food sources, and they're seeing declines in the population of these birds. So studying phenology is one way of understanding how our environment is changing and how species are reacting to these changes. But as I mentioned, because these changes vary from location to location and the response varies from species to species, it's really important to have local data from the places that we know and love and want to protect. Um, so that we can understand what's happening now and uh, address any problems that there may be. But right now there isn't a lot of really available um, phenology data. So Indiana Phenology as an organization was founded to collect and share this type of data. Um, we're really focused on documenting the timing of seasonal change and seasonal events like this so that we can utilize them um, to understand our environment, how it's changing, and to um, make better management decisions. Right now we have observers in nearly 30 counties. 
ultimately, we hope to have observers participating in every county of Indiana and documenting the timing of seasonal changes um, in, in the plants and animals so that we have a really good picture of what's happening in our state. And we do this um, by working with individuals, groups, and schools through three different programs. So we've got our Indiana Backyard Observers that's for individuals and families that want to observe in their own yards or neighborhoods. Um, we have our Indiana Phenology Trail Program, which consists of partner observation sites on public um, locations. And these partnering organizations establish observation sites and utilize um, Nature's Notebook in support of their education management or research goals. And then we also have our schoolyard phenology program, which is um, kind of cool, where we help schools and classrooms to set up observation sites and participate in collecting data um, on their school grounds as part of their classroom education. So one of our goals is to be able to compare the timing of different events from one year to the next, or to compare the timing from one part of the state to the next, to be able to identify and examine trends. Um, this right here is one way of showing the type of data that we collect. So this is called a phenology calendar. I think it's a really interesting way to visualize the life cycle of a plant or animal. Um, so the way this works is, this is for sugar maple on the top, those green bars, um, are days that someone said they saw leaves on this particular sugar maple. Um, on the, the bottom of this chart, there is, it's like a calendar, January through December. So it's kind of like a timeline. Um, and so the leafing here, the sugar maple, that started um, in April of, in May, around that time period. Um, the second line there, the yellow is for the open flowers. And then the pink at the bottom is when there were fruits on this tree. And um, phenology calendars like this are really great way of, as I said, visualizing that whole life cycle. You can see when it leaves and flowers and fruits. And um, all plants have very different life cycles. Um, our spring ephemerals, the ones that we're enjoying right now, they do all of their leafing, flowering, and fruiting in this part of the year. They, they concentrate it between May and June up there, and then there's not, no sign of it until we get to the next um, part of the year. Things like um, milkweed have a very different life cycle. They start a little bit later, May, June, and then they go into October and November. Um, so this is just one uh, way of looking at our data, but how cool would it be to have a website where you could visit and you could explore the life cycle of different plants and animals in Indiana and see when they actually are in flower or when they're fruiting at different places in the state. And that's really what we're working on building. All right, so Indiana Phenology is a citizen science project. The data I showed you was collected by our volunteer citizen scientists um, through our Phenology Trail program. And uh, citizen science, in case you haven't um, ever heard that term, it's really scientific research that's conducted in whole or in part by um, people who aren't paid professional scientists. And it's known by lots of other names, um, but citizen science really complements the work done by professional scientists by adding depth and breadth to their work. Um, scientists don't have the time or resources to study every species in every location, um, but with the help of our volunteer observers, we can study more species and more locations and really add to that body of science. So you might wonder if volunteer citizen scientists can do as good of work at data collection as professional scientists, and people have studied this, and in fact, they can. And, um, Citizen science actually is really valuable to biodiversity research. Um, several years ago, someone calculated that $2.5 billion annually are contributed to biodiversity research by the efforts of volunteers, and that number um, has increased. Similarly, um, citizen science data, data collected by volunteers like this, um, is being utilized in scientific literature. And that's what this chart shows. Um, 1997, there were only a few publications 
2014, there were over 250 and that trend is continuing. So citizen scientists really are contributing valuable um, data to science. So briefly, I wanna introduce you to to citizen scientists. They didn't necessarily call themselves scientists, but um, they both kept careful records of local phenology and their data has been utilized by scientists to learn some interesting things. So we've got Henry David Thoreau. Um, he kept detailed records of plant phenology at Walden Pond. He wrote a famous book about it. Uh, and then on the right, we've got Nina Leopold Bradley, who was the daughter of Aldo Leopold. And uh, she kept, they kept detailed records at what they called the shack in Wisconsin. Um, they wrote down the arrival times of migratory birds among other phenological happenings. And um, their records have been utilized by scientists. So let's look at what we've learned. Um, so up here, Thoreau's observations of flowering plants that he recorded in his journals have been compared to those same species in the same location. So scientists have gone back to Walden Pond in recent years and monitored those same species that he looked at in his time. And they found that on average, the species are flowering seven days earlier than they did in his time. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. They may be the urban heat island in proximity to Walden Pond, um, but really the important thing I want you to take away from this is that without his valuable data set, scientists wouldn't have been able to go back and figure out how much earlier those species are um, flowering. The second study conducted by researchers, um, they took the Leopold family's records and they went back to that same location and they monitored, the, monitored those same species. Um, and what they found is that looking at the sandhill crane and geese migration, um, those that was occurring two to three weeks earlier um, on average now than it did 61 years ago when they started collecting this data. So they've got a whole um, decade's worth of data and they're finding that it's, it's earlier like they're um, much earlier now than it was then. And again, we don't know the exact reason for the earlier arrival, but the real value here is having those detailed records to draw upon. Um, their record keeping, their writing down when things happened is really valuable to future science and our data can do the same for the future. We're really establishing that baseline so that we can see those trends and changes. And earlier citizen scientists kept notebooks with handwritten observations of phenological events. Um, but today's citizen science scientists don't have to use handwritten records. We can use a tool called Nature's Notebook. Um, and this is the tool that we use at Indiana Phenology to track um, seasonal changes. It's a program that is uh, provided by the USA National Phenology Network. Um, this platform was designed, designed to be user-friendly and, and to give you a way to collect observations while you're standing in front of those plants and animals um, in the field. And it's utilized not only by volunteers and citizen scientists, but it's also utilized by professional scientists. And all the observations become part of a national database that is actively utilized by scientists right now. Um, there are over 1,200 species of plants and animals you can monitor using Nature's Notebook and their um, monitoring instructions. So the USA National Phenology Network is really just a network of individuals and organizations across the country that care about phenology data and they're collecting it. Um, there are about 13 million records in their database that have been collected by over 11,000 observers um, at more than 10,000 sites. So this is an impressive um, body of information, but we're really focused on adding to that database information specific to Indiana because there is not as much for Indiana as there are for some other locations. It's really focused on seasonal and long-term changes in plants and animals. And we 
we study these changes by observing the same individual plants through the seasons from year to year and the species in a the animal species in a particular location from year to year through the seasons. And what doing this gives us is um, a really rich information about what those species are doing at any given point in the year. Um, there are other citizen science opportunities that you may have heard about or participated in that are really focused on just like a single point in time. Like maybe you go out and you do a bio blitz, you survey all of the plants and animals in a given area on a given day. Um, Nature's Notebook is different and then we go back to the same place over time and make regular observations. Um, observers collect the data using scientifically vetted standardized protocols. Basically, that just means um, there's a written up set, set of instructions for how you make these observations. And uh, these protocols include a list of questions that ask about what activity is occurring at, at a given point in time. And um, each of these questions that asks you are defined in detail uh, with species specific information so that what one observer sees, another observer would answer it the same way, which really makes it consistent and usable for science across the board so that we, that it's standardized. Um, and you can collect the data either with traditional paper data sheets that you then enter in a web browser, or you can use a free mobile app and just, um, one step, submit those uh, observations. I really love Nature's Notebook for that, that app and the ease of making those observations because I have in the past found that I would be really great at making observations and writing them down, but not so great about taking that second step and entering them in or keeping them organized. And Nature's Notebook really does away with all those problems if you use that app. It's just, you go out there, you answer those questions, you <laughs> click submit and you're done. Um, it's, it, I, I love Nature's Notebook. Um, also something that makes Nature's Notebook really awesome is that all of the data is freely available for download. So anyone, not just the scientists that are interested in looking at the data, but you, me, um, even our students that participate in our program, they can go download the data and see what's happening on your species, or they can see what's happening in Texas or California or any other place. And they also have some tools for visualizing your data so that you can make those calendars, those phenology calendars from, from what you've observed or what other people have observed um, and a bunch of other different ways of really looking at it and exploring the patterns, which is super awesome. So I'd like to invite you to join us to observe and document nature. Um, not only will you learn a lot about what you observe, um, but you'll be helping scientists around the country and even around the world to better understand our ecosystems and how they function and how they're changing. And you'll also be contributing to a, the creation of an amazing public resource about nature and the environment here in Indiana. So are there any special skills required? Well, not really. Um, even my four-year-old preschooler is well equipped to participate and is actually a stellar observer. Um, really all it takes is an interest in learning more about plants and looking closely at them and looking about those animals. And I'm 100% certain that any of us here uh, really can do this. So if you look at these pictures here, this is milkweed. Um, can you tell what's happening in these pictures here? I bet you can. We've got some flower buds on the left, then we've got those open flowers, then those pods, those are the ripening fruit. And then over on the right, they are totally ripened. They've opened up and those seeds, that fluffiness that's um, floating away. Um, those are different phenophases right there of milkweed. If you can recognize the difference between each of those different pictures um, and with help of a definition sheet, put a name to it, you've got what it takes to be an observer. All right, so again, the tool that we use is called Nature's Notebook. It is a platform, a tool provided by the USA National Phenology Database. And 
we use, we focus on those seasonal and long-term changes in the same individual plants through the seasons. So how do we observe phenology? This is what it looks like. You pick your location, you go out once a week. Um, you can go more often and it's even okay if you don't go off, out that often, but about once, one time per week, you visit, visit the plants that you've pre-selected, you search for animals in that given area and you submit your data. And that is it. Um, right here, this is a sample of the data sheet. This is what it actually looks like. Um, it says, um, so these are the basics of observing here on the left, it says, do you see? And then underneath, do you see all those green um, slots there? Those are each of the phenophases, those observable stages of the life cycle of a plant or animal. Um, and you answer yes, no, or question mark. Yes, I see those leaves. No, I don't see those leaves, or I'm not sure if I see those leaves or not. I love that they have that I'm not sure option there. Um, I have been using Nature's Notebook for a good five years now, and I use that question mark. There are definitely times when I'm not 100% certain that something is happening just yet, right on that, that line. Um, with Nature's Notebook, you can go back to some degree and you can fix your, uh, your answers if you find that, oh, you said yes, something was happening, but no, next week you see that it really isn't, it didn't change, it, there's, there aren't open flowers yet. Um, but that question mark is, is a great thing to utilize. Um, so that's, that's what it is, you, that's the data sheet, that's what observing looks like. Um, so let's take a look at those phenophases. Uh, there are uh, five or six for the leafing stages of, of plants, depending on what type of a plant it is, there, there are different um, phenophases. So uh, breaking leaf buds is one. Um, that's more for those deciduous plants, those woody things. Uh, the corresponding one for those plants that go totally dormant and uh, die down to the ground would be initial growth. Then there's increasing leaf size. This is when those leaves aren't full sized, they're still growing bigger. Um, then there's the leaf sphenophase, then colored leaves and falling leaves. And you uh, look at each of these sphenophases individually. Um, they can overlap. So you may say, yes, I see breaking leaf buds. Yes, I see increasing leaf size. Yes, I see leaves um, all in the same day. And then for the flowers and the fruits, those reproductive um, phases of the plant, we've got flowers or flower buds, then open flowers. Um, some plants have pollen release as a phenophase, but not all of them. Um, this is mostly tied to those plants that are allergens, where we really care about whether it's releasing pollen or not, and that tells us something. And then there's fruits ripe fruits, and then recent fruit or seed drop. So the flowers are flower buds and the open flowers overlap. So if you say yes to open flowers, you're also gonna say yes to flowers or flower buds. Um, similarly to fruits, if you see ripe fruit, you're also gonna say, yes, I see fruit in general. But that's basically the process there. So let's, let's do a little test here. This is Papa. I don't know if you're familiar with this native plant, but it has um, fruits that are really tasty. And in the wild here in Indiana, you're lucky if you can find a ripe fruit um, before the wildlife get to them, but they're tasty. They're a little bit custardy. Um, when they're ripe, they look like a, an old banana. They are sort of brown and, 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 and interesting like that. So. Let's go through this. In this picture, do we see breaking leaf buds? Nod your head if you do, shake your head if you don't. Nope, don't see breaking leaf buds. What about leaves? Yeah, we've definitely got some good leaves there. What about increasing leaf size? This one's hard to know if you don't know what, what if it, unless you know what a full size leaf looks like. Um, this one, by the time it gets to this point in the year, this was later in the year, those leaves are definitely all full size. So we're not seeing increasing leaf size here. What about colored leaves? Nope. What about falling leaves? Nope. 
it's hard to tell when you're actually observing that you're going to want to look on the ground around it. We can't really see the ground here, but I suspect we're not seeing any falling leaves. What about flowers or flower buds? Nope. Open flowers. Again, that's a no. Pollen release isn't one that we actually um, record for pawpaw. What about fruits? Do we see fruits here? Yeah, we do see some green fruits there. Are they ripe? Not quite yet. All right, and recent fruit or seed fall, that one, again, they're not ripe yet. We're not gonna see that one. So, hey, you guys have now made an observation for papa. That is it. And that is about how long the process takes for any given plant. So it's really quick. It's really easy. It's um, straightforward like that. And then it's a little bit different for animals. So the process um, for animals is that you set up a checklist of species that you wanna look for. You're not gonna look for every possible animal in every place. You wanna pick ones that you're likely to find in a particular location. And then um, when you make observations, you're gonna record whether you saw that species or not. You're not gonna be going out and like tagging an individual bird or animal and looking for that specific one. You're gonna look for the species and whether any um, representation of that species is there or not. And then for those that you do see, then you would go ahead and answer these individual phenophase questions that really get into what it's doing, what it's eating, whether there are um, nestlings and things like that. And you would answer yes or no or question mark for all of those. And again, um, thing to note here, if you don't answer a question, if you don't look for it, you can just leave it blank. So you may not want to look for all of these um, phenophases every time. And if you didn't look for it, you don't say no, you just leave it blank. All right, so how do you go ahead and become an observer now that you know what to do and how to do it? Uh, there are three easy steps. Basically, you join Nature's Notebook and you join our group within Nature's Notebook. Then you register an observation site and then you start observing. So I'm gonna briefly walk you through all of those steps. Um, so joining Nature's Notebook, you go to naturesnotebook.org, um, a Google search will get you there without any trouble, and then you can join Nature's Notebook there. Alternatively, you can download that free app and you can join Nature's Notebook through the app. Um, as a second step, whether you're doing it through the web or um, through the app, you want to join our group. You want to join um, Indiana Backyard Observers. And what that does is that connects you up with us so that we can um, communicate with you, we can share results, we can share our resources, um, and your data is pooled with all of the other observers from Indiana that are participating in our group. Um, so once you've joined Nature's Notebook and joined Indiana Backyard Observers, you can create and register your observation site. So you can really um, pick any particular location that you want to go visit and um, monitor the phenology at um, or observe nature there. You would pick your location, you'd pick your plants, you'd pick your checklist of animal species to search for, and then you put all that information in nature's notebook. That's what we call registering your observation site. Now, you're going to be the only one that can see what species you're observing at a particular site. Um, it's going to be a private site, so you'll be the only one entering data for that. Um, but I'm gonna quickly walk you through each of those steps so you've seen it. Uh, so choosing a site, how do you choose a site? Basically, number one consideration, pick somewhere convenient, pick somewhere you go all the time, someplace you care, um, nature's notebook, Observing is easy, but you're going to do it more regularly if it's something that fits in with your routine already or that you can easily establish a routine. So this would be places you walk all the time, your favorite park, your backyard, uh, your neighborhood that you walk around, something like that, something that's convenient. The second consideration for a site is that it has to be less than 15 acres. Now that is approximately two and a half football fields. So in this picture here, I've got circled a football field and then I've superimposed it um, against the sides of each of these squares. So uh, this is approximately the size of a, a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood 
or um, an elementary school or um, some agricultural fields are about that size. So that's the maximum size, but the minimum size can be the area around a single plant. If you just want to monitor one plant, um, you could monitor a plant and the insect species that might be likely to live on it. Um, it really depends on what you're interested in and the scale of your landscape. Um, but if you're in doubt, I'd say go small. Don't make your, your observation site be that full 15 acres. Um, if you do have a place that's larger than 15 acres and you want to monitor more than 15 acres, you just divide that into two sites and you create two sites. So the first part is site one and the second part is site two. Um, the reason they pick the size is because it um, relates to satellite imagery. And um, this way they can compare the satellite imagery to the um, data that they get on the ground, which um, gives the scientists useful information. And then a final consideration, you want uniform conditions around your site. Um, so if you've got a super shady area and then a sunnier area, you would want to split those up and just call them two separate sites. Again, scientists take um, species and they can average them across the site. So if you looked at, oh, let's say five um, apple trees on one given site, you, you could average the timing for all of five of those apple trees and get some information. But if you have one in that's really shady space and then all the others are in really sunny spaces, um, that kind of throws off that average. So you just make those be two different sites. Uh, again, if you've got like a woodland area and a meadow, you might wanna make those two different sites. You can have as many sites as you like. That's totally up to you. Um, I have a front yard site and I have a backyard site, and then I have a site that's around my neighborhood that I, that I make observations at. All right, so once you've picked where you want to make observations, then you pick the species. So you select those plants. Um, couple qualifications here. You have to know the species um, because you have to put that into nature's notebook, and then those definitions of what you're going to look for are cued to that particular species. And it has to be on their species list. Again, I told you there are over a thousand um, different species. So you've got a good amount of options here. You're gonna find, you're not gonna find your really rare species on the list. You're not gonna find anything endangered on this list. Um, but most of the common plants that you're likely to have um, around you are on the list. You wanna pick something that's interesting to you. Um, totally, that's right up there with being convenient something that you care about. And then it's okay if it's wild or cultivated. So garden plants are fine. Um, plants in the woods, totally fine too. It's, uh, it, that, that one's up to you. When you're inputting your data, you can indicate whether it's cultivated or wild, which again is something that the scientists utilize. Uh, if you're having a hard time deciding where to start or how to narrow this down, um, these are 10 species, well, 10 types of trees and, and plants that a lot of people across Indiana are um, monitoring. So you would be contributing to um, identifying trends and exploring those. So we've got a variety of different oak species, um, hickory species, maple species, black walnut, our state tree, tulip tree, um, service berry, goldenrod, milkweed, redbud, and coneflower. And again, there are multiple species within each of those different groups, but those are ones that uh, it's a good starting place. So general guidelines, as you're starting out, I would say pick two to three species, maybe four to six plants total. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have two or more plants of each species, because then you really get to understand that species, but that's again, an optional thing. Um, it takes about two to five minutes per plant, so you can calculate how much time you want to invest here. Um, if you want to do ten, give this 10 minutes a week, um, you're going to want to do two to three plants. If you want to do this for a whole hour every week, well, then you can, you can scale it up there. Um, as you're selecting animals um, here, 
there are a variety of common animals that can be observed. There are mammals like squirrels or deer. There are some birds, reptiles, and amphibians, um, insects like bees and butterflies and moths. Um, there's, a, there's a variety. There are fewer animal species that you can observe with nature's notebook, but a lot of those common ones in the, are in there, um, especially the ones that you're going to see in our suburban areas. But whatever species you pick, it has to be on that nature's notebook list. And um, with those animals, you're going to make a checklist essentially, and like this American robin here, and then there are those specific information about what you saw it doing that you would answer afterward. All right, so let me give you an example of how all of these pieces come together. This is one of my personal observation sites. This is my backyard site, um, super convenient. I walk around it regularly. Um, I like to walk around it and look at my plants. And, and in fact, I picked some spring bloomers because I'm always ready for spring when spring comes, I'm sure you're like me. And so I wanted to keep track of when that spring was happening and how it, how it um, changed from year to year. So that was some data I really wanted to keep track of. Um, I also have my orchard trees as the trees that I observe in my backyard site because again, I really care about those and understanding what stage they're in, that phenology um, helps me to get more fruit. Uh, so I have about 16 different plants in my backyard. Um, I literally only have to go a few yards between the trees and my orchard corner here. So it doesn't take me but 15 to 20 minutes um, to hit all of those. I go out on Sundays um, my relaxing late afternoon thing that I do. So it's just in my schedule, um, but it's super accessible. It's representative of my area and stuff that I'm interested in. All right, so the next piece of this is putting all of your choices in nature's notebook. And I've got to tell you, be honest here, registering your site is an annoying process, but you only have to do it once. And once you're done with that, then you get to enjoy the benefits of being able to use Nature's Notebook to keep track of stuff that you probably want to keep track of anyway. And if you um, get going on this and run into any problems, I am 100% happy to help you through this process and get you over any hurdles there are here. Um, you can either register your site through the app um, basically, you do that here, you log into the app, and you'll go to, um, you'll select personal sites on the top there, and you'll go to sites, and then on personal sites, you'll click create a site, and then that will open up this plants and animals tab for you, and you'll click on the add plants and animals, and one at a time, you'll put in that species, you can give it a um, nickname, can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, and then you'll save that and you'll repeat that process for each of those uh, plants and animals that you want to observe. And then once you've put those pieces in, um, you're good to go. I don't think I mentioned it there. Let's go back here. Once you hit create a site, it's going to ask you to put in a name for your site and a location. And the easiest way to put in that location is just like put your pin on, on the map that it, it pops up. So that's the process. You can do the same thing through the web interface. So you get to that by going to naturesnotebook.org and you'd log in, and then that'll take you to the screen that they call your observation deck, which is really where you interact with Nature's Notebook. And it has, um, this, is, this is what the bottom of that screen looks like, your observation deck. It's got sites on the left, then my plants and animals, details for this organism and then observation. And the way this works is on the left, you can, you can monitor many different sites. You can participate in many different groups. Um, all of those will show up on the left here and you just select the one that you want to be um, participating in or you wanna view, and then that'll populate the other three um, boxes here. So if you select on something different on the left, that changes that my plants and animal list. Um, the way that you register it here is you go add a site and then you'll go um, put in that location and information and then you add plants and animals. Once you've made it through this process that you only have to do one time, 
Then you're on to step three, making observations, um, where you get to go out and observe that nature and enjoy it and spend time outside um, being one with nature and learning about what's going on and keeping track of it. Um, again, you can record your observations through the web interface where you would log into your um, observation deck and you would enter observations there through the observations box, or you can use that app. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times the Nature's Notebook protocols. Basically, that's three different um, pieces to the instructions. Um, there's that data sheet that's the, do you see X, Y, Z? Yes, I see it. No, I don't. I'm not sure. So there's the data sheet. Then there's information about each plant or animal. And then there are phenophase definitions. So for each of those um, phenophases for each species, there's slightly different um, information on what you're looking for. So like, especially with the fruits, um, an apple looks very different from a milkweed seed. And uh, both of those are what we call fruits, this fruits phenophase, but the definitions, the phenophase definition for an apple um, is going to give you information so that you can recognize an apple as the fruit that you're observing. And the same for the milkweed, the definition gives you information so that you can recognize when you say, should say yes to ripe fruits for the milkweed. Um, you can, access those protocols right in the app. Um, next to each phenophase question, you click a little button. Um, and actually, I think I've got a screen for that right here. Um, you would click that little eye next to the phenophase and it'll pop up that definition for you. So you always have, as you are using the app, that definition to look at. And I often will reference those, even though I've been doing this for years, just to make sure that I am seeing and saying yes to the right thing. Um, so in the app, you make your observations in that observations tab right there. And um, you make your submit your observations through your observation deck if you're using the web browser. All right, so we already did a little example here and I think we'll not um, spend a lot of time on this, but this one is Eastern Redbud. So the phenophase definitions here would give you information to help you know that those pink things, those are the flowers, those pods there, those brown pods, those are your fruits, and then um, those are the leaves on the right. And using those definitions, you could look at this particular picture here, and you would be able to answer those questions, um, something like this. Um, interestingly about this picture as a side note here, this is red bud in the fall. And red bud normally only has its flowers in the spring before it has leaves. Um, but this one, this particular year, it was late um, and really warm late on in the um, season. And so this red bud got some flowers. They didn't ever open up, but it did get flowers later in the season. All right, some final notes here. So we're finishing up. This is a great activity for bringing a buddy. Um, these are my two uh, best observation buddies. This is my oldest son and my youngest daughter. I have three others. They're not as excited about going out with me, um, but this is something that totally can be done by anyone. And it's always more fun with a friend. Um, make it part of your routine, put it on your calendar, have that be something that you do on a specific day it really helps make this um, something that you're more successful at doing. And um, if you have any problems at all, I am here to help. E answers are just an email away, um, be that identifying species or deciding whether something is actually in a particular phenophase or not, or uh, making your way through the process of registering your observation site, anything. Um, I am more than happy to help. You can reach me at info at indianaphenology.org. Um, and again, that's, that's, that's what my job is, helping people um, get through this process. And that brings us to the end. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions from anyone right here. Yeah, I will go ahead and unmute people in just a second here. If you 
have questions, go ahead and pipe up. You should be able to unmute yourself at this point. So I'm curious, um, for instance, in the dead of winter, when nothing much is happening, I would assume uh, weekly observations wouldn't necessarily be needed uh, because we do go for weeks and weeks where absolutely nothing is happening. <laughs> months and months almost even. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, totally. Um, so I should add that into my presentation. So I will make a note to do that. But yes, um, typically what I do is when it's once I have hit a no for all of those phenophases for a growing season, once I know it's over, um, I'll go out once a month just because it gives me an excuse to get outside and I still need that in the winter. Um, but I try to make sure that I am out early enough in the season to get a set, a fresh set of no's in the mm -hmm. spring. That way, that no followed by a yes is how we pinpoint that starting point. Okay. Um, because okay. we can have that first yes, but without a no at some point before it, we can only say it started sometime in the past, you know, if we, we did October and then February, you know, we, it, it's so that going out um, early enough to get that no. Yeah, so I, can, I can see the value of going out uh, maybe in early March when things might start, like with forsythia and so forth, we might start showing some signs of something right. happening. Yeah. And I, I guess with, with my backyard site, it's totally easy because I can just look out my window. It's like, yeah, maybe <laughs> I should start making those observations again. <laughs> um, so you're exactly right. Yeah, that's totally fine. And then right. even sometimes in the middle of the summer, you're going to just have a string of yeses and there's not going to be a lot of change. Um, it's okay to back that out. It's mostly when we're changing and we want to get that starting and end point. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. If also, if you're observing in an area you don't have control over, because you, of course, have control over your backyard, but um, uh, observing in a place where others are doing the maintenance or the care of the plants around you, um, uh, I would think that there could be a challenge there because things might get uh, interfered with that. Uh, um, you don't have any control over, I would put it that way. Yeah, so that happened with some of our school sites. They picked some things that were a little bit too close to the path and they got stomped on and then they, <laughs> they couldn't observe those anymore. Um, <laughs> one thing, it's always a good idea to get permission if you are not the owner of a particular site. Mm -hmm. um, for public sites, um, one of the possibilities is making it be a, a public observation site. So turning it into a site along our phenology trail. So you could not, so you would not be the only one that observed it. So other people could observe it. So that that typically involves um, getting the owners of that site or the staff at a particular site involved in setting it up. So that's mm -hmm. another possibility. But yeah, you be ask for permission is always a good idea. And then mm -hmm. pick something that's far enough to the side or out of the way of traffic so that it's not going to be, um, so it's less likely to be deserved. Okay. Disturbed is a good idea. Any other questions for Amanda? Okay. Well, thank you again, Amanda. I personally learned a lot. Um, there's some fascinating information. I'm going to definitely look at things differently when I go for my walks now and in my neighborhood. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for supporting the Carmel Clay Public Library and its programs. There are a couple of upcoming programs that I want to mention because they um, might be of interest to you and you can still register for them. So the first one is called the Tornado Scientist Storm Chasing with Dr. Robin Tanamachi, and that is on Monday, April 25th from 6 to 7 p.m. That is a virtual program um, and it's definitely storm season in Indiana, so you might learn something and hopefully we don't have 
have any tornadoes for you to watch this season, but it's always a possibility living here in the Midwest. The second program is Backyard Birding. It's a bird walk we're taking on Wednesday, April 27th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Carmel Central Park. Obviously that one's in person and registration for both of those events can be found on Carmel Clay Public Library's website, carmelclaylibrary.org. So that brings us to a close to tonight's program. Thank you for attending and have a good evening. Thank you, Amanda, very interesting. Thank you. <laughs>